Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. Dear people of God, the first Christians observed with great devotion the days of our Lord's passion and resurrection. And they became the custom of the church to prepare for them by a season of penitence and fasting. This season of Lent provided the time in which converts to the faith were prepared for holy baptism. It was also a time when those who, because of notorious sins, had been separated from the body of the faithful, were reconciled by penitence and forgiveness and restored to the fellowship of the church. In this manner, the whole congregation was put in mind of the message of pardon and absolution set forth in the gospel of our Savior and of the need that all Christians continually have to renew our repentance and faith. I invite you, therefore, in the name of the church to the observance of a holy Lent by self-examination and repentance, by prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, and by reading and meditating on God's holy word. And to make a right beginning, let us now pray for grace that we may faithfully keep this Lent. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing you have made and forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain of you, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Broken, you are the only true 
Please be seated for the reading of God's Word. first reading is from Isaiah 58, 1 through 12. Shout out, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people the rebellion to the house of Jacob, their sins. Yet day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways. As if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interests on your own fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with the wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is, not, is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own skin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. And then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in darkness, and your gloom 
be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. This is the word of the Lord. The psalm for today is Psalm 103, verses 8 through 14. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. This is the word of the Lord. The New Testament lesson for today is 2 Corinthians 5, 20 through 6, 10. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him, then we appeal to you, not only to receive the grace of God in vain, for he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, (laughs) and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. But we put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labor, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love by truthful speech, and the power of God with weapons of righteousness, and for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise. We are treated as impostors are yet, and are yet true as unknown and yet well known as dying. And behold, we live as punished and not yet killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be God. God. Speak, O oh Lord. As we come to you to receive the fruit of your holy word, take your truth planted deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets 
so that they may be honored by men. <clears throat> Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the streets corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they'll be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their full reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust decay, destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Brothers and sisters, this is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord. Teach us, Lord, full of So I, th I think that Ash Wednesday was one of the first Anglican or Episcopal services that I ever attended. And if it wasn't the first, the first time I went sort of looms large as this foundational moment for me in my imagination, which uh, probably explains a whole lot about me, doesn't it? Um, for those of you who know, who know me well. So when I was in Bible college, uh, our campus didn't observe the seasons of the church calendar. So there was no Lent, Advent, Easter, I mean, there was Easter Sunday, but there was no Easter season, things like that. So a few of us would walk about a half mile from the campus to the Cathedral of the Diocese of Chicago. And the sanctuary of the cathedral was this massive cavernous room. And Ash Wednesday wasn't a very well-attended service, so the room felt even more imposing, right? It was an empty, cavernous, massive room. And it's the only service I attended in that space until I attended an ordination maybe a decade later. So I don't know if that cathedral ever felt like bright and welcoming and warm the way our sanctuary does. But on that day in February with gloomy clouds and the lights can hardly illuminate the space and no one's there, the architecture itself seemed to be preparing us for Lent, it seemed to be speaking to us as we knelt and we confessed and we started this penitential season before Easter. And the reason a bunch of Bible school kids would want to go do this thing is because we knew there was something about Lent, something about this penitential season that we were lacking. Yeah, every day can't be Christmas. Every Sunday can't be the happiest day. Our lives need rhythms and cycles and routines. And Lent is one of the ways that the church helps to purposefully and intentionally slow us down and force us to examine ourselves and take stock of our lives through fasting and prayer. Ash Wednesday, this starting day, doesn't need much of a sermon, which you can be grateful that means the sermon's short. The liturgy itself does a lot of heavy lifting. It began with this clear and sobering instruction on what the day and the season are about. I'm just going to reread a couple parts just to bring them to your, the front of your mind. It's a time in which converts were prepared for baptism, but it was also a time when people who were, had notorious sins and had been separated from the church 
were reconciled by penitence and forgiveness and restored into fellowship. And in this way, the whole congregation was reminded of the pardon and absolution we hear in the gospel, that Christians have to renew our repentance and faith, which is why we're invited to the observance of a holy Lent. That, by the way, you know, people aren't always sure how to wish people like Happy Lent, that can't be right. Merry Lent, Holy Lent, that's a good, you can also say Penitential Ash Wednesday if you'd like. Um, that's the proper literature. I don't know, if that, that's how I greet people. But we do it through self-examination, repentance, prayer, fasting, almsgiving, and reading and meditating on God's holy word. And then we prayed for grace that we might faithfully keep this Lent. So tonight, I just wanna share a couple brief thoughts on what I think faithfully keeping Lent looks like, on what fasting well looks like. Fasting, of course, doesn't just have to be refraining from eating food, although that's clearly one of the options and one that we could commend to ourselves. Uh, but we fast by taking something that is ordinarily a good thing, and we abstain from it as a way to pull back and redirect our attention to God. So that's my first point, is that fasting well needs to be God-directed. Uh, I often say fasting without prayer is just dieting. Right? If you're not fasting, if it's not pointing you towards God, what are you even doing? You're just changing your habits. Maybe good, but not what Lent's about. And it has to be God-directed, and Jesus addresses this in the Sermon on the Mount. Right? He says there are some who fast or pray or do their good deeds in such a way that they get recognition. They do it in public. They, they show everyone what a good job they're doing. And so the way they pray or give to the needy or fast, it's all about being seen. And that might be true for us. Um, it's easier to not be seen with your, with your ash cross when you go to the evening service. There's always a bit of a, a debate. You know, you go at noon, how quickly do you wipe off the cross off your forehead? Do you do it like right away? Is that practicing in front of others? Are you being ashamed if you wipe it off? You don't have that conundrum, lucky for you. But there's another, maybe more important audience that I think we have to be concerned about. And that audience is ourselves. Right? That false self, the old Adam, that still rises up within us. There's a way that we can engage in spiritual disciplines that we don't let anybody else know except for that part of us inside that pats us on the back. Right? You know what I'm talking about. The part of you that doesn't look to God and delights growing in your faith, but the part of you that sees your spiritual disciplines as a one-for-one -one spiritual workout. You're, you're making gains. You're increasing your max deadlift. You're flexing in your spiritual mirror and saying, look at how good I am at fasting. My form is perfect. Look at how I'm not telling anybody how much I'm eating today. They can't even tell that I've given up social media for Lent. That's what a good job I'm doing. Pride is so often waiting just outside the door, wanting to pounce. And so the line between healthy discipline and unhealthy pride and self-satisfaction is really, really thin. Fasting is good. Depriving ourselves of things for a season is good, and it's not meant to be enjoyed either. We don't talk about Jesus' really refreshing prayer retreat in the wilderness. We talk about Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. That's what we're modeling when we do 40 days in Lent, we're remembering Jesus' own preparation for ministry. And it's such a temptation because when we strip away some comforts, when we fast and redirect our attention towards God, the accuser wants to stop us the most. Because it's often when we deprive ourselves of things that we're suddenly able to see a little bit more clearly. And that's exactly what the enemy doesn't want for us. The enemy wants us lulled into, into distraction all the time. For, for me, I don't know if this is true for you, for me, the enemy wants me to mindlessly go through the infinite doom scroll of my phone and never stop and think about my day. Never stop and think about where I saw God today. Never think about where I was moving away or towards love, charity, and hope. Two of the three things that Satan tempts Jesus with are related to pride. This is why prayer and pausing and giving space are such a necessary part of fasting well, so that we can do the hard work of self-examination, to ask ourselves tough questions, to listen to God so that we're not deceptively telling ourselves how good we are and how great we are, or maybe how bitter we are and how we can't wait to get to the other side of Lent so we can have chocolate or Slurpees or beer or whatever. These, you know the list of things I've given up for Lent at some point. <laughs> These are the, the things that we can slip into, but the point is it's supposed to direct us towards God, not to impress ourselves, not to impress others, not to feel good, not to say, look at how much I did this Lent. It's way more than that last Lent. I got caught in that trap when I first became an Anglican, when I first started observing it. It's like every year I wanted to Lent harder, or Lent even more than last year. This is not the point 
of a faithful Lent. And when we properly and open-handedly turn ourselves towards God, and we redirect our attention, then we get to start prioritizing the things that God cares about. Because when you're wandering through the wilderness, it's so easy to get lost, and so you have to constantly reorient yourself so that you're heading in the right direction. I hear a lot of folks who want to pray for revival. They quote 2 Corinthians, or sorry, 2 Chronicles 7.14. Right? You're probably familiar if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. And when you hear that, typically you get the sense that the person saying it already knows the wicked ways that need to be turned from, right? It's all the sins that everybody else is doing. <laughs> those are the things. If, if my people would just pray, all those sinners out there will get their act together. But that's not how sin works. That's not how prayer works, and that's not how repentance works. If we're going to faithfully engage in Lent, and open ourselves up and say, God, what is twisted and still broken within me? We have to start with the assumption that maybe we don't know it yet. <laughs> maybe there are things that we don't know about ourselves, and we've been lulled into thinking we're doing just fine on X, Y, and Z, and it's that hunger pang or that desire to do this other thing, that moment where we pause and we say, oh, maybe I'm not as patient as I thought I was. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm not as loving as I thought I was. Maybe I'm not as righteous as I thought I was. And then maybe there are other things that God wants us to turn our attention towards. This is what the people in Isaiah's day were facing. We read today that, that God is saying through Isaiah, for day after day, they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Or in other words, gods, we've been doing all the right things. Why aren't you noticing? Pay attention to us. We're doing it right. Look how righteous we are. And God answers. And pay attention to the things that he points out. He says, yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. The Sabbath day, which was meant to loosen everyone from work, from the owner all the way down to the field hand, suddenly becomes a great day for the owner and a poor day for the field hand, because the owner gets to take the day off and fast and do these pious things, but the workers, no, no, get to work. Your fasting ends in quarrel and strife, striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is that the fast I've chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? We might say, yeah, isn't that the point? Humbling ourselves, sackcloth and ashes, that's the deal, right? No. God responds, this is the fast that I have chosen, to loose the chains of injustice, untie the cords of the yoke, Set the oppressed free, break every yoke, share your food with the hungry, provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them, not turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn. Then your righteousness will go before you, etc., etc. Think about that list. Why doesn't their fasting work? Because they're worshiping really, really well and then oppressing their workers. They're humbling themselves and then leaving injustice intact. What kind of fast does God want from us? What things does he want us to reprioritize? Well, he doesn't want a fast where we come to church and have a really beautiful, meaningful Ash Wednesday service, where we have a Lent where we're all on our faces in front of this altar, and then we allow hungry people to be unfed in our midst, to allow the poor to go without food and the naked without clothes. God desires a fast in which we loose the chains of injustice, untie the cords of the yoke so the oppressed are free to break every yoke. Yes, sometimes that yoke, that oppression is a spiritual thing. And we are, as Dan has started to lead us in, to become a church of healing, of prayer, where people can come and those burdens that they have can be lifted, those spiritual burdens. But sometimes we're not talking about spiritual poverty. Sometimes it's just actual poverty that God wants us to care about. Real hunger, real homelessness. It's why Lent is not just fasting and prayer, but fasting, prayer, and what is traditionally called almsgiving. But fasting and prayer and us caring for those who need it the most. 
I used to be in a diocese where we would gather every year as clergy. At this one church, it was sort of a, a yearly event for the clergy. And the church had like no lobby. So the sanctuary had sort of doors at the back and just this tiny little like vestibule and then the other door to the outside. So as the clergy all lined up to sort of process in and our long line of like 50 clergy, well, it, it extended out the building and around, sort of out the door around the building, right? And so here we are lined up. And if you've ever been to a clergy event, uh, clergy don't pack their worst vestments. Uh, when they're showing up to see other clergy, they pack their nicest vestments. So everyone's in their nicest vestments. Uh, you know, if you were to count the cost of the vestments that we are wearing, the albs and, the, and all the stoles and things like that, there's a lot of money sitting in that line. And it was always uncomfortable every year because we'd stand in that line, ready to process into the church, and we'd look to our left to this neighborhood that had been hit with some economic downturn. And here next to us was an example of some people who weren't doing so well. Usually people weren't out, it was like a Thursday at noon, so there was nobody walking around. But we all felt pretty uncomfortable, at least those of us who picked up the, the difference between the thousands of dollars of vestments next to poverty. I don't think we were doing anything wrong that day. There's nothing wrong with buying vestments. I'm wearing them now. But there's something uncomfortable about worshiping God with nice things and, and seeing poverty around you. There's something uncomfortable about it, and there's something sobering about being well off next to poverty. And it, there should be. There should be something that makes us uncomfortable when we encounter people in need and we are not. There's a reason there's a whole parable of a rich man who gets a lot of money and he says, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to build up more stuff for me. I'm going to build another barn and then I'm going to be set for life. For life. That's right. He was set for life because <laughs> in the parable, God says, you fool, your life's going to be taken from you tonight because you weren't generous with God. And I don't think he's talking about tithing there. I think he's talking about you were given an abundance to bless others. I think this is true of Lent and any other season, that God doesn't want our wholehearted, emotional, spirit-filled worship if it doesn't direct our hearts to the things that he cares about. Our worship and our fasting and our prayer and our Lenten disciplines should fuel our love of neighbor. Our prayer should be for our neighbors so that we begin to love them more wholeheartedly. Because a love of God that excludes love of neighbor is not really a love of God. Loving God but not loving our neighbor is not actually loving God. Righteousness is relational. And so if our righteousness is only about, I don't do any of the bad things that other people do, but our righteousness is not about getting into the weeds with the broken and the brokenhearted, then our righteousness doesn't look a whole lot like the God who chose to become human, to take on flesh, to cross the uncrossable gap between us and him in order to bring us home. If our fasting doesn't make us more like Jesus, then it isn't fasting for Jesus. Fasting isn't just God-directed, but it hopefully starts to pull us in God's direction, give us new priorities, help us see the things that God's calling us to do. And that's heavy. It's heavy to start off Lent and be like, here, get ready to learn about all the bad things about yourself. But that's the good news about this talk. Not that part, what I'm going to say next. The good news is that Jesus loves us more than we love him. The good news is that Jesus longs for our righteousness way more than our ability to fulfill that righteousness. It's why he came in the first place, not just to die for us, rise again, and bring us back to neutral, to pay our debt. <laughs> paying our debt is one of the biblical metaphors for what happened on the cross. But when I think about paying our debt, I think about, I ate a meal and someone covered the bill, but I'm back at zero. Jesus' death and resurrection, grace doesn't bring us back to zero. <laughs> Grace builds something new for something that wasn't there in the first place. Grace goes beyond. Grace is like, I didn't pay the check, and God pays for it and gives me 20 bucks. That's, that's what grace is like. Grace is like, paid our debt and gave us a living wage. Jesus died so that we could have sin defeated. The things that hold us back, the things that continue to lead us down the way of ashes and death. And so... Our Ash Wednesday Collect, which we'll be hearing every Sunday this season, he makes it, it makes it clear this. God hates nothing that he has made, and God forgives the sins of all who are penitent. 
God doesn't just want to forgive our sins, but then it goes on to say, create and make in us new and contrite hearts. Because Lent isn't a season of self-deprecation and self-hatred, it's a season of grace. It may not seem like it at first it gets this reputation for being a dour season, but Lent is a season of grace. It's 40 days where we're kind of frozen in time in the parable of the prodigal son. We're frozen in time in that moment where the, where the prodigal son comes to his senses and says, wait a minute, I'm eating pig slop, and even the servants in my father's house get better food than this, and they're, and they're just turning around to go home. That's what Lent is. It's coming to our senses and heading home. But the difference between us and the prodigal son is that he's expecting to go home to a father who's disappointed with him and scowling at him. And in Lent, we celebrate grace. <laughs> so we know we're going to turn around to the father who's waiting for us and looking down the road, eager to run to us. Lent is turning from sin because we know there is grace. Lent is turning from sin because we know how much God loves us. In just a minute, we're going to have the imposition of ashes, in which I'm going to make the sign of the cross on your forehead with ashes to say, you're dust and to dust you shall return. It's a reminder of your mortality. It's an incredibly humbling moment as a priest to tell people, hey, you're going to die just like everybody else. It's a very sobering moment and it's an uncomfortable moment. But I'm making the sign of the cross with that dust because I'm not just telling you, hey, give up, you're gonna die. I'm saying, remember you are dust and to dust you shall return while reminding you of your savior who has given you grace. That's the weird tension of Lent. It's a full recognition that we can't do it on ourselves, but God loves us so much that he did it for us. Paul gives this encouragement to the Corinthians that we heard tonight. Be reconciled to God. Now is the favorable time. So that's my encouragement for all of us in Lent. Do not shy away from spiritual disciplines, but lean into them. Allow them to do the work in your soul that will produce righteousness. Fast and pray and read your Bible and give in such a way that God can till the soil of your heart and plant new life there. And when you fail at your Lenten discipline, which most of us will multiple times, we all have very good intentions today, and we're going to mess up between now and Easter. And that's not the point. The point isn't, did you do it perfectly? The point is, did it direct you further into the love of God and love of neighbor? I would rather, as your pastor, I'm going to say this, I would rather you mess up during Lent and not keep your Lenten fast, but do it in such a way that you are drawn more upward and onward into the love of God than to have a perfect, spotless discipline, but believe yourself to be righteous at the end of it. If at the end of Lent you think about how good you are, (laughs) you can try again next year. That's the good news about the church calendar, right? The things you are going to give up are nothing compared to the things that God wants to produce. So don't assume that you already know what is right. Don't assume you know what God's going to do. Let the season be one in which you lay your soul bare to the one who wants to restore you because his love for you is stronger than death. He hates nothing he has made. He forgives all the sins of those who are penitent. And when we lament and acknowledge our wretchedness, such visceral words, When we lament and acknowledge that we can't do it ourselves, the God of perfect mercy gives us perfect forgiveness. May God help us to observe a holy Lent. Amen. And so now let us call to mind our sin in the infinite mercy of God. Almighty God, you have created us from the dust of the earth. Bless these ashes, we pray, that they may be for us a symbol of our mortality and a sign of our penitence, that we may remember that it is by your grace alone that we receive the gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Dust and the dust is not
Remember that you are dust. And the dust will shower you. Jesus, remember that you are dust. And the dust will shower you. Remember that you are dust. And the dust will shower you. Remember that you are dust. And the dust will shower you. Remember that you are dust. We'll now read Psalm 51 responsively. 
Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. Wash me through and through from my wickedness. For I know my transgressions. Against you only have I sinned. So you are justified when you speak. Indeed, I've been wicked from my birth. For behold, you look for truth deep within me. Purge me from my sin, and I shall be pure. Make me hear of joy and gladness. Hide your face from my sins. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Cast me not away from your presence. Give me the joy of your saving help again. I shall teach your ways to the wicked. Deliver me from death, O God. Open my lips, O Lord. Had you desired it, I would have offered sacrifice. But you take no delight in offerings. The sacrifice of God is a troubled spirit. A broken and heart, God, Let us humbly confess our sins to the Lord. Most holy, holy and merciful, merciful Father, Father, we confess to you and to one another and to the whole communion of saints in heaven and on earth that we have sinned by our own fault in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. We have been deaf to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved your Holy Spirit. Lord, have mercy upon us. For we have sinned against you. For all our unfaithfulness and disobedience, for pride, vanity, and the hypocrisy of our lives. Lord, have mercy upon us. For our self-pity and impatience and our envy of those we think more fortunate than ourselves, Lord, have mercy upon us. For our unrighteous anger, bitterness, and resentment, for all lies, gossip, and slander against our neighbors, Lord, have mercy upon us. For our sexual impurity, our exploitation of other people, and our failure to give of ourselves in love, Lord, have mercy upon us. For our self-indulgent appetites and ways, and our intemperate pursuit of worldly goods and comforts, Lord, have mercy upon us. For our dishonesty in daily life and work, our ingratitude for your gifts, and our failure to heed your call. Lord, have mercy upon us. For our blindness to human need and suffering and our indifference to injustice and cruelty, Lord, have mercy upon us. For our wastefulness and misuse of your creation and our lack of concern for those who come after us, Lord, have mercy upon us. For all false judgments, for prejudice and contempt of others, and for all uncharitable thoughts towards our neighbors, Lord, have mercy upon us. For our negligence in prayer and worship, for our presumption and abuse of your means of grace, Lord, have mercy upon us. For seeking the praise of others rather than the approval of God, Lord, have mercy upon us. 
for our failure to commend the faith that is in us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Show favor to your people, O Lord, who turn to you in weeping, fasting, and prayer. For you are a merciful God, full of compassion, long-suffering, and abounding in steadfast love. You spare when we deserve punishment, and in your wrath, you remember mercy. Spare your people, good Lord. Spare us in the multitude of your mercies. Look upon us and forgive us through the merits and meditation of your blessed Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ desires not the death of sinners, but that they may turn from their wickedness and live. He has empowered and commanded his ministers to pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He now pardons and absolves all who truly repent and with sincere hearts believe his holy gospel. For this reason, we beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that our present deeds may please him, the rest of our lives may be pure and holy, and that at the last we may come to his eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us exchange with one another a sign of the Lord's peace. Jesus. Our offertory sentences are from Scripture. Offer unto God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows unto the Most High. I've forgotten the words that you had spoken. Promises that burned within my heart have now grown dim. With a doubting heart I follow the paths of earthly wisdom. Give me my unbelief. Renew the fire again. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on me.
praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. All things come of you, O Lord. Of your own have we given you. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You bid your faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal feast, that fervent in prayer and in works of mercy and renewed by your word and sacraments, they may come to the fullness of grace which you have prepared for those who love you. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him so that he may dwell in us and we in him. And bring us with all your saints into the fullness of your heavenly kingdom where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. Apart from your grace, we are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table. But you are the same Lord whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, 
and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secures. He As life endures through many dangers, toils, and snares, my path already comes. Tis And grace will lead me home when we bid there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun. We Than when we first begun. O Lord our God, grant us grace to desire you with our whole heart, that desiring you we may seek you, and that seeking you we may find you, and that finding you we may love you, and that loving you we may hate those sins from which you have delivered us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.